This is Duke University. Hi, my name is Paul Grantham. Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to Primetime. Uh, we created this forum about, uh, I guess, four years ago now, back in 2006. And we did this uh, to give employees an opportunity to hear directly from senior administrators on topics that were important to them. Today we're going to be talking about health care, uh, but before I get to that topic, I wanted to cover a few uh, announcements. Um, first, you should have picked up, if you're on site, um, a comment card. If you would fill that out uh, before you leave and drop that off. Um, if you are watching online today, uh, there's a link to a survey at the end of the presentation. Uh, same comments, if you would fill that out and submit it uh, before or, um, you close the browser window. Uh, we use that feedback in helping to plan future events, so we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Um, if you have a question, this, if you haven't been to primetime before, this basically breaks out into two parts. And so the first part is really more of a uh, formal discussion with our speakers today. Um, the second part is when we will open it up to audience Q&A and questions, so we'll take your questions. Um, if you have a question and you're on site, if you would raise your hand. We have microphones. We want to make sure that everyone here in the audience as well as people online can hear your question. Um, if you're watching online, uh, there should be a uh, web form on the Primetime website somewhere right below my feet probably. Um, if you would submit that at any time during the presentation. Uh, and we have someone here who is monitoring uh, those questions and will help raise those questions up here to us. So um, again, our topic today is healthcare, and we are very fortunate that we have uh, two experts on the topic uh, to speak with us today. So please welcome uh, Cal Cavanaugh, Vice President for Human Resources, and Dr. Michael Cuff, Vice President for Medical Affairs with Duke University Health System. <laughs> so, um, Kyle, let me start with you. Um, we've heard a lot uh, over the last year um, around uh, the topic of health care reform. And um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what we can expect with health care reform in terms of Duke's health plans? Sure. I'd be happy to try to start with that, Paul. There are certain things that we know well and certain things that are still relatively unclear. Um, I find it interesting that if we had held this uh, forum at this time last year, uh, the topic would be national health care reform debate. Uh, the debate is now over. Uh, we actually have a law, uh, Patient Protection and Affordability Care Act, and that is going to usher in uh, changes between now and 2020. Uh, we had been well about the business actually during the debate of taking a look at what impact it would have on our plans and what our choices and options would be. Uh, certainly immediately upon the passage of the act, we spent quite a bit of time taking a look at uh, those impacts and what it would mean for our plans both in the short and in the long term. I have a couple of uh, very, very quick slides that I would show you, and these are just meant to highlight some of the things that we'll see, but a number that I would throw out there for you from the employer side, it, it is expected that between now and 2020, there will be approximately 1,000 individual rules, decisions, choice points that the federal government and employers will have to make. But these are some of the high points that we will see for 2011. Uh, the first, on a very good level, is we're going to see more people actually have access to care. So specifically, uh, children up through the age of 26, irrespective of their uh, student status or their marital status. Uh, we've spent quite a bit of time running a lot of algorithms as to what that would mean for us, how many people might take advantage of that, what are the cost implications for us. Uh, that number is a low of 700 to a high of 3,000 individual people. It could cost the plan approximately a million dollars. So it's not a free addition in terms of our covered lives. The other that will impact individuals immediately for 2011 is there is a change in flexible spending accounts and what you can actually utilize uh, flexible spending accounts for. So over-the-counter medications no longer can be uh, covered under a FSA unless it's accompanied by a prescription from a physician. 
Uh, several others will have impact more on other employer plans than they will directly on ours. So, for example, you're seeing some changes in the lifetime maximums, which we currently have at $2 million, uh, that cap coming off. We don't anticipate of that having an immediate impact on us, but uh, one interesting note, over our last year, we have had several cases that have pushed the million dollar limit, which I'll speak to a little bit later as well. We will see a onslaught of additional reporting requirements on all employers. So out in 2013, we are going to be required to be reporting to the federal government on a monthly basis uh, who is enrolled in what plans and what dependents are they currently covering. Uh, that is going to uh, drive our need to collect Social Security numbers from dependents, and we've actually started that as part of our dependent audit. The other last one that I would mention for 11 is we will see a change in your W-2. So it actually won't be in the 11 W-2, but in the printed W-2 that you see in 2012. But starting in 11, uh, within our information systems, we have to house the employer cost of, of what that uh, premium is. Now, I will take a look at uh, kind of a timeline here, and I've just simply highlighted some of the changes. And for the audience, the, the takeaway from this is that each year uh, between now and 2020, uh, we will see different changes that will impact our employer plans. So we're in fairly good shape for 2011. Uh, we've had some really good successes with the plan during 2010. Uh, but it will really be a year-by-year -year analysis in terms of what happens to the plan. So some highlights to take a look at as you look out in, for example, 2013, we will see another change in the flexible spending account where it will be capped at $2,500. The real big changes, though, from an employer perspective, come into play in 2014. And if you see that box there, you'll see a number of different significant changes uh, that will impact our plans. This will be where across the nation you will see state by state the introduction of what are referred to as health exchanges. Uh, those are undefined yet. Exactly what will be uh, contained in those exchanges uh, is unclear. But over the next two years especially, lots of work will go in there. We will have a requirement as an employer to communicate choice points to individuals. The other, for people that are on the processing end of this, if you're familiar with how health insurance works from an employer perspective, typically what happens is a person is hired and they have a defined period of time in which to enroll in their health plan. If they take no action, they're actually out of the plan until the next annual enrollment period. This strategy actually gets flipped on its head out in 2014, and there's an auto-enrollment factor. So in, in fact, what happens is that if individuals take no action uh, within their first 90 days, they're actually defaulted into the plan. So that will have some impact. And then you'll see the last two things that I will mention is out in 2018, uh, we will see the federal government start to implement what is referred to as an excise tax on what would be referred to as Cadillac plans. Uh, we are right at that edge right now, but there's a lot of moving parts between now and 2018. The other thing that people keep pointing out to me as I always put up this timeline is there are two presidential elections uh, between now and 2020, so there could be a lot of additional changes that we see. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. So that's kind of the employer side, the insurer side. So, um, Mike, can you tell us about what, what we're looking at in terms of the impact of a provider, a health, health system provider? Yeah, this is uh, a very interesting time. Uh, as Kyle alluded to repeatedly, and as all of you sense, there's actually a fair amount of uncertainty there. There's uncertainty because although there's a law, the policy to go with that law hasn't largely been written yet. And that really is what en in ends up impacting the providers like hospitals, but also the providers like doctors, and the impact can be different, very different. Um, in addition, um, there are these elections and so on, and even if all the policy were in place right now, um, some of the state level experiments haven't exactly gone as predicted. So looking out five and ten years in healthcare in this country, uh, it's with more uncertainty than I think we've had in a long time. There are some things, though, that are certain. Um, we are all preparing for a greatly reduced uh, reimbursement. Uh, although many more people now will have insurance through the exchanges in the coming years, 
most of them are being added to the Medicaid rolls. There are some in the exchanges as well, depending on how employers use them, and uh, there remains a substantial number of uninsured that will still be out there at the end of this. Nonetheless, in the, in the law as it's written, there are very dramatic, almost draconian reduces, uh, reductions in both physician and hospital reimbursement as you move out three, five, and 10 years. If you put that in the setting today that most hospitals in this country are generating no profit, 0% margin, and it's those margin dollars that buy the next CAT scan that rehabilitate the 50-year-old hospital or what have you, the fact that they're um, stagnant right now with this in the horizon is, is a very dangerous time for many standalone hospitals. So declining reimbursement. Greater transparency is coming as well. Um, this relates highly to quality, but it's the transparency that's demanded by the payers, the government among them, but also the employers about are we providing a quality product and can you prove it? And, and if you can prove it, can you um, uh, perhaps earn a reward or avoid a penalty? And this is true both for the uh, hospitals as it has been increasingly over the past five years, new for them, but still five years, uh, utterly new for the, the, for the providers. There is a uh, website right now called Hospital Compare run by the government that at least gives you differences in terms of Medicare outcomes. Physician Compare is coming, and that puts more tools in the hand of patients. And then sort of the, the final thing is there's a need for alignment. It's becoming clearer and clearer. You see this in the state. Many of the uh, uh, doctors and hospitals are aligning with either Carolinas, Wake Forest Baptist, UNC Duke, or ECU. Um, systems look like they might have the, uh, the, the scale to uh, uh, manage through this and perhaps sustain and survive through this, and individual hospitals don't. You see that locally in our own market with some of the very dramatic cost cutting going on at local hospitals, as well as others that are frankly losing money today and are really desperately looking for partners. So you're gonna see alignment, transparency, which is good for our patients, and then the need to be efficient in the way that we provide care because of um, falling reimbursement. Um, so a lot of change to come. Um, in terms of, we're approaching October, which is typically the time when we have open enrollment for our own employee health plans. Um, Kyle, could you speak to kind of what our experience is in terms of our own health care costs with those plans this year? Uh, certainly. Uh, I think first, uh, setting some context numbers for everyone to realize. Uh, there is no insurance company. There, we are uh, the insurance company. So our plans are self-funded. So we use what are referred to as TPAs or third-party administrators, but those administrators are simply set up to help process bills and payments. But we really are our own insurance, if you will think about that. We currently cover uh, approximately 57,000 covered lives, so that's a, a big number of people. Uh, we do uh, perform in a very, very efficient manner during 2009. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time back there in diagnosing kind of where our costs are, how do we compare. And so we did uh, engage some external consulting work to take a look at how do our plans compare from a cost standpoint virtually against any other peer that you can imagine. So we looked at the higher ed market, we looked at the academic medical center market, we looked at local regional hospitals, we looked at local and regional employers. And we're running about 30 to 35 percent below cost. And so uh, our plans from that perspective have performed very, very well. However, uh, that being said, uh, we still have some big dollars at stake. And so in uh, 08, when we looked at those numbers, uh, we saw dramatic increases going into uh, 09. The 09 number at about 195 million. And the numbers I'm showing you here are what we refer to as all-in numbers. So this is both from Duke as an employer and then employee contributions. But that number for this year is expected to be at about $203 million. So very, very large dollars. Also one of the major contributors in terms of managing our fringe rate. Um, I do have what I refer to as kind of the, the elevator speak slides. And so the first, I think, from an employee perspective that's very important to understand is, well, how do our premiums actually compare? And how do we compare to other employers? And when you take a look at this slide, we've taken uh, the Duke Select plan, and we've compared that at both the individual and the family level, and you'll see that our premiums at that level compare very, very well. But what is important, and I think the, uh, one of the messages that I wanted to convey this afternoon is, 
that we are all going to become more uh, informed consumers of how does this work and what are the economics behind it? Because this is all collectively, if you will, in our community, our money. And so how, how does that all come together? But part of the elevator speak also is if unfortunately uh, you as an individual or your dependent were admitted to the hospital, and what this example here is for maternity, but there are other kind of similar types of diagnosis that would fall into that category, it could cost approximately $8,000. So of that $8,000, and you or a family member then actually go in for that care, what is your out-of-pocket cost? And you can see on this slide, it's $450. Now, we have had, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, we have had certain cases within the past year that have pushed a million dollars, a million dollars. And so the out-of-pocket costs for that individual or that individual family were a couple thousand dollars, not a trivial amount of money to be sure, but the plan in those cases paid $995,000. So our plan by and large is in very, very good shape. Uh, our costs uh, have been managed appropriately, but we still have to keep a very, very close eye on this. And my understanding is <clears throat> that the majority of care uh, among employees and family members here at Duke is provided at Duke in terms of part of the health system. Um, Mike, could you kind of speak to what efforts are have been underway or what's been done to help manage costs uh, from the employer side? Yeah, we're, we're lucky here in that we're not um, already sort of uh, behind, if you will. If you think about Duke Medicine, the School of Medicine, the faculty, um, we have for many decades been focused as a, as a shop that's nationally known for creating uh, evidence-based medicine, both doing the clinical trials that determine what works best for our patients and then um, uh, disseminating those guidelines. And that's really one of the strengths that uh, we're known for. Um, we're also the largest training program in the state for doctors in terms of residency. So many, many graduates across our region are in fact graduates of our program and have been, like myself, sort of indoctrinated into this evidence-based practice. That's important because uh, around the country, of course, doctors are paid to do things. And so both the patient has an incentive because they feel like more is better, but the doctors have an incentive. And that's part of this spiraling cost. Um, if you look nationally then at our Durham market and Duke in particular, we're actually very efficient providers of care. So if you look at Medicare um, uh, expenditures for a, a retired person um, in other parts of the country, dramatically higher than in our region. So we're already a low cost provider, I think because of our focus on providing the right medicine at the right time. We're going beyond that as well. As many of you have been here for a while as I have, um, you see urgent cares. You see a lot of the primary cares that are now in a wider network for our, um, uh, for our, prov uh, for our uh, employees and uh, open late hours, early in the morning, uh, trying to make sure that those options are there for you when you need the care so the emergency room doesn't become the expensive default, both expensive for the employee and expensive for um, the insurance program and the hospital, frankly, as well. And then we're also trying to do uh, more things, working with Kyle to make sure that um, uh, generics that our doctors know to prescribe generics when appropriate, know how to use Medco and the mail order, which has been successful, and I know we might, uh, might come up today. But then um, uh, also try to find ways to be more efficient providers of care still. Many of you may have experienced the patient portal. Um, that's only going to continue to grow. That puts more control in your hands, but also um, provides uh, faster and easier ways to, to access care, records, make appointments. And uh, I think we're ahead of the game, although we have to be creative in terms of way we ways we provide care and become yet more efficient, both for the market, for our own sustainability as a health system, and then also as uh, the key provider for uh, the Duke employees. So, Kyle, what other things are taking place on the employer side to help mitigate costs? I know that from going from 195 million last year to projection of, I think it was 203, um, this year. So w what efforts are underway to help mitigate that continual increase? We have had a, what I would label as a very comprehensive um, look over the last year and a half in looking at our plans and, and we know a lot uh, about cost drivers and what's going on. And so as we back this up to the beginning of 2009, uh, one of the things that is driving health care costs for us is just simply the number of people that we cover. Now, we are covering today 3,000 more people than we covered 
in uh, 2009. So that escalation, there's not much we can do in terms of controlling that factor. The other factor, though, is taking a look at our administrative costs, which because the only thing that we use outside parties for are some of those administrative charges, we've really squeezed that cost structure down. And so uh, arguably, I think our contractual provisions are some of the lowest that you would find anywhere. We have also partnered very, very closely uh, with the health system, both on the physician network side as well as with the facility side. And it has been terrific partnership in helping to look very uh, critically at our cost drivers and getting those under control. Now, in 2009, uh, we have had a spike in our pharmacy-related costs. That $203 million number, uh, approximately 25% of that number is now in drugs. So it's a big piece of how we're kind of managing our healthcare costs. We were on a trajectory that had we not made any changes, I would be here today talking about premium increases in the 10 to 15% range for 2011 had we not made those changes. For the first seven months of this year, we've taken 2009 and 2010 and compared that. And we will be running at about $6 million below what we spent on pharmaceutical costs in 2010 compared to nine, even though we've actually seen a slight increase in utilization. Uh, that has primarily uh, been driven by a number of different factors. One is when you take a look at our data from 2009, we would be labeled as an outlier in a population of 57,000. How many people were actually on maintenance medications using a mail order component? Uh, with the incentive structure that we've put in, we've now moved that needle from 24% to 48%. The other factor that has helped enormously is working with our providers and also pushing the notion of utilizing, where appropriate, generic equivalents. Uh, we were actually pretty high with that to begin with at 69%. That number has now moved to 75 the, the big deal, or what does that matter, uh, part of that question is, for every 1% that we move that needle, it represents about a half million dollar savings to the plan. So the more that we are actively engaged in that, the better off we're going to be. We are doing all of the traditional business practices that you're seeing now, certainly in industry, that we're a little bit behind on, for example, dependent audits. So we've put that in place as well. But the other two pieces to build on some of uh, Mike's comments that uh, each of us are going to have to be actively engaged is one is we know now through science that there is a correlation between certain behaviors that people do or don't do. So smoking, exercise, eating properly, all of those things have a relationship to disease states. Those disease states have a strong relationship to cost. So it's, uh, I would implore everybody that we have to take a look at how we're managing our own personal well-being. The second is becoming really informed consumers. Mike talked about the layout between emergency rooms, urgent care, and primary care. And what we have to really be conscious of is how do we access that system? Because that access drives costs throughout the system. Excellent. Um, so Mike, uh, before we open up to Q&A, there's one other question that I wanted to cover with you, which is around, you know, um, technology is changing uh, every day. There are a lot of changes. What, what can we expect to see uh, either in the near or um, kind of out in the future with healthcare and, and the delivery of care? So, uh, uh, Paul, we're going we're gonna to see an awful lot of changes. The, the biggest one is this understanding of the shift from uh, medicine as the treatment of illness to the provision of health. Um, as I alluded to before, um, historically hospitals and doctors were paid when they did something or when something happened. Uh, although we experimented with something called capitation in, uh, you know, more than a decade ago, again we're shifting back towards medicine is about wellness. And when you hear these comparisons to the UK or Australia, New Zealand or Europe or, e or even other developing countries that um, on paper seem to have better healthcare outcomes than we do, it's because their focus is not on taking care of the sickest sick, which we still need to do, but making sure that I get a postcard that says I should get my flu shot shortly because they just became available, um, that uh, I turn 50 and I need a particular test, and that um, the medical system is more proactive in the, in the health 
of the patient, not just allowing them to sit out there and wait for something to go wrong. So you're going to see a lot more focus on health and management. Um, you're going to see a lot more being put into the hands of the patient, not just the portal, but um, you know, if we think about um, uh, the, the comparison or the, the structure that Kyle and I just drew with primary care, urgent care, and the emergency room, you consider the emergency room the hospital, there's room past the hospital when you're discharged for uh, telephonic care, online care, um, care that looks a lot different than it might today that helps keep you home and keeps you well. Just as for more minor things, there might be uh, telephone triage, nurse practitioners, PAs, um, other sorts of allied healthcare providers, or, or even how many of us use WebMD or the other online um, uh, medical dictionaries, if you will. And we're going to see a lot more tools about providing care in your home. That's going to conflict a little bit with the medical licensing world, but uh, I, I'm confident that's going to continue to develop. So the, the big competitive fears, from my standpoint, aren't the other healthcare systems. It's the Microsofts and the Googles and the rest getting into healthcare because they can provide a lot of tools on either side of sort of the traditional um, uh, come to a place to get your care. IT is going to play a role in there, so um, one of the advantages that we have for the uh, employee health plan is that the hospitals are tied together with one medical record, as are all of the doctors. That provides efficiency, so tests aren't duplicated uh, unnecessarily, and we can all share in one common record. And then um, finally, again, the drive towards efficiency. Hard to know exactly what that looks like, but it's pretty clear that this, um, this business about um, almost um, uh, heroic levels of care uh, at the last minute rather than prevention leading up to that and, uh, and understanding at that point in time, there's going to have to be some change there in the way that we provide that care because the current trajectory is, uh, is not sustainable. And um, uh, although the, the plan, uh, uh, health care reform has dealt with some aspects of that trajectory, uh, there's some big aspects that have been left out. So the commercials that I see about interacting with your physician through video conference, not completely untrue, huh? Not completely untrue. It's yeah. coming. Excellent. Um, I've heard the, the term accountable care organization more frequently. Um, can you describe exactly what that is and how it works? Do you want to give it a try and I'll, I'll add in as well. Sure. I, I will take a, a stab at that. Uh, I think first it, it really uh, does take a approach of managing and delivering care from a very different position and trying to uh, look at outcomes, uh, which is very inconsistent with how we currently compensate a health provider. So right now, if you're an individual practitioner, right, the, the more you do, the more you earn, right, irrespective of outcomes. And so the, the words accountable care is taking a look at holding the entire system accountable for healthy outcomes. And, and that's, that's where at a fundamental level it's looking at. So practically, what does that mean for us? Uh, in the Duke Select piece, we will see a more refinement of our physician network. Uh, that is actually a very, very good thing. So currently, that uh, network has about 1,200 physicians in it. We will uh, scale that down to about 1,100 physicians, uh, picking up on a couple things that Mike mentioned that will really assist in the delivery of care is now uh, we are somewhat disconnected in how care happens where a individual employee sees physician A and sees physician B. In the New World Order, that medical record uh, shared so that those two physicians can collaborate, but more importantly, don't duplicate certain efforts that they don't know the other one actually performed. So that's at a first part. The other is that we are uh, uh, subject to the same type of economics that other plans are, where we have about 5% of our population accounting for about 45% of our cost. And so identifying individuals that represent the highest risk and attempting to work collaboratively with them. So we will move into the space of health promotion and disease management and have a much more integrated delivery system. What does that mean in English? For us, we'll rebrand uh, some things that we've had historically like prospective health and live for life and bring those programs closer together so that we can be more efficient and more targeted in terms of how we actually go about delivering care. You know, from a provider standpoint, an accountable care organization is easiest to understand in the framework of a single primary care doctor. And that is, uh, they used to, um, this is simplifying it a bit, but they were there when you were sick. 
um, for, for children, perhaps they were there for the well child visits, but largely they were, they were there when you were sick. It began to change and then they began to think about prevention and evidence-based medicine, what's your cholesterol, what's your blood pressure. But they were still dealing with one patient at a time. What we're doing is we're sort of turning and now they need to think about their panel of say a thousand patients and how many of them have gotten their flu shot? How many of them have I checked their blood pressure in the last year? How many of them have their blood pressure under control? And getting tools that help them manage a thousand patients together rather than one at a time. When you think then about them also taking on risk perhaps, which is included in here, where they'll take rather than a fee for visit, rather just a fee for the patient, and then they manage all thousand of those patients. When you play that out and you think about the risk of some patient coming along with a million dollar bill, you begin to think that um, you have to be in larger systems to manage that risk. And indeed, even managing 57,000 is tough. Managing hundreds of thousands are tough, and it's part of the drive why physicians are aligning with hospitals. So you manage both the outpatient and the hospital, but also why the hospitals are coming together in bigger systems to be prepared to better manage, um, leverage their, in, uh, their information technology, and manage that risk. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I wanted to move on to the uh, Q&A session. So again, if you have a question, raise your hand, and someone will get a microphone to you. Or if uh, you're watching online, again, you can submit your question at any point in time. should be at the lower half of the screen underneath the video. Um, so I want to start. We received a number of questions online um, before uh, the event. And so I wanted to start with a few of those because um, I think they're uh, very relevant. So um, Kyle, I'll start with you. So one of the questions that we received was, um, how do we stop the upward spiraling health care cost? And will the increasing cost affect the yearly salary increase? So, uh, so two parts of that. Uh, I think one is that I think it is a natural phenomenon that we will see uh, costs increase uh, based on a whole host of factors. One that I mentioned is just the number of people that we have, and we are projected to grow that population uh, over the next three to four years. So um, kind of managing that spiral will be very difficult in that environment. Uh, there are some things, though, that we have learned, and so we have to become one on the consumer side, each one of us, to be very involved in those decisions. How do I access a system? Uh, through which door do I enter? Uh, am I actually engaged in that discussion? That discussion uh, cascades down to taking a look at as simple as it is of actually engaging in a dialogue with your physician about something as simplistic as, is there a generic equivalent? Um, that question, extrapolated over 57,000 covered lives, has some serious implications from a cost standpoint. So all of us are in this together. I think the second thing that I mentioned earlier is about being very proactive in uh, adopting a healthy lifestyle and all of the factors that go into that. And those range from uh, how do I access a system and am I staying attuned to actually the recommendations from my physician and am I adopting and living a healthy lifestyle? So those are all factors. I think as we look out over the next couple of years, uh, I feel uh, marginally optimistic uh, in terms of our ability uh, to actually manage this. At the end of the day, these will be very difficult financial trade-offs for us in any given year about if we have a dollar, do we invest that in health care? Do we invest that in retirement benefits? Do we invest that in compensation? And I envision that to be kind of an annual discussion uh, for the next several years. Um, the next question, Mike, uh, I'll throw to you. Um, this is related to the health system. And if you're, if you're not making money, why expand in every county in the area and build new offices? I think the health system is a lot better off financially than what we are led to believe. Wow, thanks, Paul. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, I indeed, um, uh, the health system is doing well, and uh, we should all both be proud of that, but also uh, count our blessings at this point, and I'll explain why. You know, in, uh, I've been here at Duke for over 20 years, and um, uh, I recall the indenture to sort of create the university, and it wasn't just to create a university, it was to create a university with a school of medicine and a hospital to care for the patients of the Carolinas and to improve the health care of the nation. I think over the life of this university, we've done a good job. Um, those of us in uh, leadership positions have an obligation to ensuring that there's another 80 years in the current construct. And um, 
part of that then is dependent on the health system at the present time in my view. Um, the health system compared to most hospitals around the country that are at best breaking even is generating um, substantial margins in the past years in the seven to nine percent range. Um, those dollars have been uh, able to be used to fund the School of Medicine, to fund our educational and research missions, and also to contribute to the common goods of the university, including making the health plan larger and therefore easier to manage and in some ways help control uh, costs as well as uh, uh, contribute to those missions. Um, moving forward, as I said, uh, there's a lot of jeopardy in healthcare. It's one of the reasons that the health system was set up uh, in 1998 as a separate corporation to sort of insulate the university from that tremendous risk because there have been some pretty bad years in the health system uh, and now in the past five years some pretty good years. Our hope here is that as we come through health care reform, we'll be well positioned to continue to be the economic engine so that those dollars can not only continue to flow, but the health system will survive and thrive and then continue to meet the missions as, uh, as laid out for the university, as well as uh, uh, contribute and throw those margins over to help the missions of the School of Nursing, the School of Medicine, and the overall university. Um, it's an interesting time. Many of our um, peer universities that have a hospital attached to them are looking at that hospital with um, uh, you know, great anxiety because of the uncertainty in health care. But I'm confident that if we continue to provide efficient care, we'll do well. We'll provide quality care. We'll be transparent. And um, the net result is uh, we're better positioned, and I've actually never been more optimistic than I am right now, even in the face of this uncertainty because surely they can't bankrupt every hospital in the country. So as long as I'm better than 90% of our peers, I know that we have a future. I know that we'll be strong and be able to continue to, to help the university in that way. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, so Kyle, the, the next question uh, we received, I think was probably best suited for you. Um, I have had two specialists inform me that they will no longer be able to participate in Duke Select after the end of the year. Will I need to upgrade to a Blue Cross plan to continue to see my current non-Duke physician? Um, it all depends. And so uh, this goes back to the point that I made earlier that uh, one of our efforts in terms of managing our costs will be to go ahead and uh, create a panel of physicians that we can move towards a accountable care organization and be responsible for the care of a population. So we will see some changes in the Duke Select and Duke uh, Basic um, network uh, that will go from a panel of about 1,200 physicians to a panel of uh, 1,100 physicians, so about a change of 100 physicians. There will be no changes in primary care physicians, so all the primary care physicians that are in that network today will be the same primary care uh, physicians that are in there for 2011. Uh, what we did do is we went back and took a look at our population also for those 100 physicians and uh, backed the clock up by about 12 months and took a look at anyone who had care provided by that physician. And there have been direct communications uh, sent out as we speak to individuals, all in an attempt to have them be able to make an informed decision going into open enrollment. Uh, we will go through a fairly elaborate process of what is referred to as a transition of care effort. So if a person is currently under active care, let's take pregnancy as an example, that someone is seeing a physician and that pregnancy will move into 2011, they will be able to stay with that physician until the end of that pregnancy and then move to a different physician. But people will have those choice points uh, during the open enrollment period. Excellent. Thank yep. you. Uh, and then last, and then I'll open it up to the floor, um, the last question we received around why does health care reform deal with health insurance instead of the cost and availability of health care? Mike, you want to start with that? So <clears throat> there are three great problems with healthcare today, um, quality, access, and cost. And um, uh, I would say that healthcare reform has uh, dealt fairly effectively with two of those. Uh, access is the most obvious, and uh, the way access gets interpreted is, do you have insurance? You know, do you have s insurance that someone can, can uh, uh, that allows you to go to the emergency room, to go to urgent care, to have a primary care doctor, and be able to afford the care that, uh, that you'd like. Um, there are somewhere in the range of 33 million uninsured people in this country right now. And uh, the health care reform through the exchanges as well as getting people into Medicaid deals with more than half that population. 
most of the rest are actually um, uh, immigrants in this country illegally or people that have chosen not to sign up for Medicaid or other programs but are eligible today. So it deals with the majority of, um, of the uninsured problem out there. Quality, um, I think it deals with that pretty well also. Um, the Medicare, as such a dominant player out there, and the government, therefore, has been demanding transparency of hospitals in terms of how good our outcomes are. Do patients get infections and so on and so forth? Duke has done an extraordinarily good job there and I think has, has, has led nationally in many ways. Um, in addition, they're demanding that, that same level of transparency and quality of the physicians, and there are many hooks in the uh, minor reforms to payment that provide um, penalties for bad care and incentives for good care, so that if you develop an infection in the hospital, say, Medicare is simply not going to pay for that or the care that goes along with it. That pushes hospitals to both be more transparent, but also to provide better and better care and to make those investments. So um, the third arm there is cost. Um, it remains true that uh, uh, short of capitation, um, the, the doctors in the hospital still largely see they provide a service, they get a fee. And um, what the patient sees is they pay a copay and they get something. So I've, I've used the example before, I, I know you know, but you know, if Best Buy was giving away flat screen TVs for a $25 copay, I'd kind of like as many flat screen TVs as I can get. Because um, in the end, the patients have a smaller piece of the game than the employer does, than the government does. And so in cost reform, although there have been minor bends in the curve about cutting reimbursement to hospitals, but surely we can't bankrupt every hospital in the country, forcing issues of efficiency and quality, uh, it remains a, a bit of a, of a mystery what five and 10 years is gonna look like right now, because it could be that um, the Medicaid that a lot of these uh, new insured gets, the doctors won't take Medicaid patients because you see that in Wake County right now. You live in Wake County, you have Medicare or Medicaid. There are really no primary care doctors that are accepting those insurance products except the Duke Primary Care Network. And so um, uh, it, the, the cost curve is, uh, is going to be interesting. Um, I, I suspect that through evidence-based medicine we might see some rationing in the future without invoking death panels or anything catastrophic. Um, I think the incentives will push doctors to provide more and more evidence-based care. I suspect, as, uh, as Cal suggested, the patient will be more involved, if not the Duke patients, but in different programs, the patients have more at risk. What was sort of the concept to be tying the, uh, the health savings accounts, having only insurance for catastrophic issues and managing the price yourself. But at least today, uh, even in our market, the prices of things aren't obvious, so I can't research like I might a TV, understand the cost, understand the best quality, and then go buy it there. In healthcare, we might be able to do that eventually for preventive care and for a lot of the elective stuff, but you know, if I have an accident walking outside of the theater today, I'm gonna to be taken to Duke Hospital, just as if I have one in, uh, you know, in uh, Western Raleigh, I'm gonna be taken to Wake Med. At that point of need, we often don't have the choice that allows the patient to guide that as much as we'd like. So health reform has dealt with two of those. That, uh, that third, the cost curve, is sort of the uncertainty five and 10 and 15 years out that uh, uh, our goal as Duke is to remain uh, viable, uh, as good or better than anyone else, as efficient as or better than anyone else, so that we can survive and continue to fulfill our mission and be part of the university. I have, by the way, been checking the Best Buy circulars, and <laughs> not yet. Um, so I want to turn it over and find out what questions uh, our on-site and online audience may have. So if you have a question, again, please raise your hand and uh, we'll get a microphone to you. What are our cost increases going to be next year? Uh, if I want to repeat the question. Yeah, if we, I think the question was, what are our cost increases going to be next year? Cost. Right. So uh, we, uh, I mentioned in 2009 that we brought in uh, an external firm to take a look at our uh, cost structures and uh, how it was uh, organized. Uh, we recently brought that firm back in to take a look and also to compare ourselves to their book of business. Uh, their book of business, which includes many of our peers, are running a uh, cost on the premium side about 11 to 15 percent increase. 
Uh, because of what I mentioned earlier on the success that we've had with our pharmacy costs, uh, we will see uh, less than half of that number. So uh, I wish I could tell you it would be uh, zero, uh, but we're probably going to be in about a 5% range. Uh, when you take a look at that, say, at the individual level for uh, Duke Select, so that premium right now is at $60 per month, uh, we'll probably see that move in about the $63 uh, range. So uh, I think the success we've had in the plan here is once again playing itself out that we'll see cost increases less than half of what you're seeing on the national level. Before I came to Duke, I had a rate structure was 80, 20, you know, you pay 20% out of coverage costs for hospitalizations. I'm kind of concerned if we move to that in the future to cut costs. I don't, haven't heard that's going to happen, but that's always probably on the table. Um, I had a fell back surgery two years ago and it's painful for me to sit down. I may need another surgery to get better. Um, you know, that's going to move my motivation to get the surgery if we change to an 80, 20 structure. Do you have any? input from anybody whether that kind of move is going to happen and and if so is there any alternative that you could like right now we have two dental plans a and b you pay a higher premium for greater coverage could they consider having a higher premium for those who want more blanket coverage and a lower premium for those who want the 80 20. let me just make sure people online heard it as well i think the two questions one around um your Prior employer, I guess, had a, a plan that was set up 80-20. Uh, the employee pays 20% of the cost. The employer pays 80% of the cost. And is Duke looking at something like that? And if so, when why, might we know or find out? Um, and then the second question around the dental plan. Uh, we have two options now. And is, is there a possibility of uh, providing greater coverage at a higher premium? And, and I think you wove both of those together, if I, if I understood you correctly. And so. Uh, first, what, what's important to understand, if I understand your question correctly, is that 80-20 is actually on the total cost of care. And so in the example that I used here earlier, I put the slide back up, it would be that the individual would be exposed to 20% of that $8,000 number. Uh, so that's currently not the structure that we have. If you take a look at our premium structure, uh, where the university is paying approximately 83% of that premium, the individual 17 splits out differently as we get into dependents. As we look at 11, uh, there are no plans at ch uh, to change that kind of fundamental structure and to move that. Uh, much too early to tell uh, what would happen in 12, 13, and 14. Uh, we are starting to look at those out years, but that would be uh, one of the last things that we would do in terms of moving that kind of cost shifting in there. Uh, I think managing our premium structures, managing our co-pays are all tied into the themes that we've been hitting here this afternoon about being very engaged in the provision of care and being a very good health care consumer. You know, I, I would add to that that uh, there are so many things today that um, uh, employers understand that are levers before they have to turn to a program like that. The use of generics and the use of mail order, as we talked about, that can control expenses at a you know, for so many patients versus worrying about the, the folks that have upcoming medical bills and trying to put them in a different bucket. Uh, in addition, uh, you often see employers negotiate. Um, you, you hear some about the travel medicine. You know, if you need a knee replacement, go to India. Sometimes you see that, but what that's really about is who's providing the best care at the best cost. Uh, frankly, do cost where it's likely that someone in Western Carolina may eventually end up in a health plan that makes them come here because we can provide the best care at the best cost. And so one of the advantages, again, is we have that in our backyard, and I would hope that we were always um, uh, able to be cost competitive so that there are so many other levers that one can pull before an employer throws their hands up and said, boy, the employee has got to take on 20% of that cost. So um, to your question about uh, future surgery, I certain, certainly wouldn't rush into anything for the possibility that something may change here because uh, at least next year and the out years, um, uh, that doesn't seem as likely a necessary change. I actually have two questions. 
Uh, the first one is, has Duke purchased any of the latest MRI machines where the patient does not have to actually go inside of the machine to have an MRI? And secondly, what is the exact day for integrated medical records for the physicians? Could you repeat the last question again? Integrated medical records for the for the physicians. Got it. Um, so the, uh, I'll repeat the questions. One was about open MRI for people that are uh, claustrophobic or afraid of tight spaces for the MRI, and then the second is uh, related to a date for integrating the medical records. Uh, let me deal with the second first around the medical records. So um, uh, what's interesting is uh, although folks don't recognize it quite to the same degree, uh, at least right now in the health system, the three hospitals effectively have one medical record and that everything dumps into a central place that we can access. In fact, no matter where you're seen in the health system, you have one medical record number that's sort of behind the scenes. In addition, all of the faculty doctors, as well as many of the employed community doctors, um, are on effectively one medical record. I think um, we're revisiting the scheme that we have right now um, and the vendors that we have relationships with in terms of our medical record, both in the clinics and in the hospital. But um, we do have an advantage of many of our peers in that everything comes together into what we call a decision support repository. It's allowed us to be um, more efficient in our business and understand it better. Um, we've provided access to the community doctors as well to this same medical record, but of course that's more of a one-way street. One of the things that you're going to see in the future, and you're already seeing our market, is Rex and Wake and others employing large numbers of doctors and putting them on the same record. I don't think that um, uh, the coordination of physicians and hospitals or the integration that we see demands employment as an outcome. There's lots of ways that you can work together. But I do think that more commonly, you're going to see doctors in the Durham and the regional community on one medical record. And in large part, um, with the network as Kyle and, and his advisors have created for next year, they're effectively on that same platform. Uh, it's active right now. And then in terms of a question about open MRI, um, I, I, I can't say offhand if we have one of those machines or, uh, or multiple, but uh, if any of you have walked over to the medical center, you probably recognize there's seven cranes and a huge hole in the ground there. Um, uh, right now, part of, uh, of uh, doing good and doing well at the same time, um, the emergency rooms at all of our hospitals have never been busier. Uh, Duke Hospital is um, uh, a newer but still aging facility and is absolutely packed. And in fact, uh, if any of you have spent the night in the emergency room, I personally apologize for that, but there are no beds upstairs and um, it, is, uh, it is catastrophic as these smaller hospitals are, are, co are collapsing their services more and more seems to be coming here to the point where we really can't even take down a ward to redo it. So there are an enormous amount of capital purchases, including new MRI machines, in the new building. The new building will both give us newer intensive care units, more operating rooms, more space upstairs for the patients to come, as well as allow us in sequence to take down and redo the other areas of the hospitals that some of you, uh, you know, acknowledge that, uh, and I acknowledge, that need a little bit of a refreshing. Um, in that, uh, both for the cancer center as well as for the new hospital tower, there's an enormous amount of purchasing going on and I'm confident that uh, there'll be more options for people who are afraid of tight spaces, both in terms of MRI and the latest technology that we're, um, we're outfitting with, with um, if it's appropriate. There are other, there are other technologies out there, um, uh, like um, uh, there's something called Proton Beam, which costs tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And as we look at that, those are the type of purchases that we can't justify. Like we don't think that um, uh, Duke has uh, uh, the, the business going there, that it's evidence-based enough right now, that it's an appropriate type of investment when we need those dollars for our other missions and for um, uh, making sure the health system is there for all of us. So um, we're going to have more and more of those online as we refresh the buildings, but um, I recognize that those opportunities are more limited right now. I, I don't know that for certain. I don't know that for I, I don't know that for certain. 
And, and Paul, if I may, uh, just on the technology front, uh, one of the things that if you are in Duke Select or Duke Basic that I want to encourage everybody to actually actively participate in is utilizing the Duke portal. Um, we are in, going to increasingly be pushing that. It has, again, in managing our costs, uh, some serious cost implications, the way that you go about making appointments, accessing your record, accessing your information, and we will be pushing a lot more information behind that wall for e each individual. There's more and more functionality all the time. You might be able to see already, um, starting uh, in the past week, uh, you can see your radiology images there, and um, in the coming months, you're going to see a lot more functionality so that that really becomes a destination for your health. We have a question online. Yeah, this, uh, this person asked, will Duke ever move to a health insurance plan that provides financial incentives or disincentives for healthy and unhealthy behaviors? For example, charging more for coverage if you smoke or paying monthly gym fees if you use the gym at least twice a week? I think there, there are a host of different strategies that we will um, continue to explore. Uh, quite frankly, the self-disclosure on smoking is one that uh, is probably first on the queuing up. We won't see that in 11, but we'll take a hard look at it during 11 for uh, 12. But we do have very strong incentives right now for individuals that under the current program of prospective health, that for those individuals that are at the highest risk levels, if they enroll in prospective health, if they actually adhere to the different recommendations that are coming out of a combination of physician-based and care managers, they can earn up to $450 that can be applied towards their medication. So if we have someone with uh, diabetes, as an example, who goes through that, they essentially could receive that medication at no cost during the course of the year. Um, I think we will always continue to take a look at incentives, but they will not be limited just to individuals. I think one of the things that we've talked about this afternoon uh, that we will continue to take a look at is our compensation structure of how we compensate our physicians. And are we incenting the right behaviors there as well? But th those are brilliant suggestions the, to the 80-20 question. Those are the types of things, providing those positive reinforcements for good behavior that uh, make a lot of sense and can lower the cost of plans for employers. I think we have another question online. Yes, uh, this person asks, when will the Duke Select provider list for 2011 be available for review? to uh, the individuals that are going to be uh, most significantly impacted, but it will be uh, available online in front of open enrollment. I, I should mention, uh, if I had my druthers, we'd do open enrollment in a, just one day. we limit it to a day. Uh, and uh, the reason for that, I've been doing it a long time, and what you end up seeing is in that first day, you see a, a, a giant increase, and then it goes silent until the last four hours. <laughs> kind of rallies in that. But this year, tied to national health care reform, um, the addition of children up through age 26 requires an enrollment period of 30 days. So uh, our annual enrollment period for this year will actually be a 30-day enrollment period. Uh, the provider directories will be available, uh, obviously, prior to that, but certainly during that, so people will be able to make informed decisions. We have time for maybe one more question. of some of the wellness programs that we have here at Duke and making those more accessible to employees such as Live for Life. And I was told that my uh, mic was uh, dr getting tired, so I'll uh, try to use this. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. So. Uh, I think if I heard the question correctly, will there be more emphasis on uh, wellness and health promotion uh, efforts as we move forward? And I think I can tell you unequivocally, absolutely. Uh, so we will be rebranding the prospective health program under the label of Duke Well. Uh, and with that, we will be integrating more of the work that we do with Live for Life and bringing those two things together. But I think uh, we will be continue to focus on the uh, initial assessment, having people complete health risk appraisals, understanding their own personal health risks, and then taking a look at what choices they can take to mitigate those risks and offering everything from smoking cessation to exercise uh, programs and the like. I think we're about out of time. So 
Um, I'd like to thank Kyle and Mike for joining us today on an important topic. Um, and again, a uh, reminder that uh, this session will be recorded and offered online after today for those who could not participate. Uh, and uh, we will, in November, be back to talk with Greg Jones about Global Duke and our efforts there. So uh, again, please fill out your comment card. If you're watching online, please complete the very brief survey. Uh, we appreciate your feedback, and thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.